We're now working with molecular geometry, and this is very, very important. It loves to show up on the test. You need to know it. So a lot of stuff revolves around this. And so, again, I cannot emphasize how important it is you understand this process of drawing up this molecular, molecular geometry. A lot of the questions you'll find on the test will actually revolve around the I, I first step of actually being able to draw the structure. From that point, you'll be able to identify the type, the bond angle, uh, all that information. So it's very, very important you're able to do, go through the skill. The first type, I'm going to keep it very general as we go through this, we call these ideal geometry. The central atom has no lone pairs of electrons, this is a key aspect here about the ideal geometries. Now when I put out the letters, I'm going to use the capital letter A will be my central atom, and capital X will represent the non-central atom. In your textbook, capital B represents the non-central atom, but for us in our notes, it's going to be letter X. So the first type I'm going to talk about is an AX2. So one, one central and two things on the opposite side. The example, this one is actually, the geometry is called linear, so that you need to know that. Um, what I'm going to give you on the test is I give you B, E, F, 2. So you know, all your beryllium's in group 2 has two valence electrons, only wants to form two bonds, so I have one central and two external in that process. The bond angle, which you have to know from this, the bond angle is between the X's. The bond angle revolves between the X's. So from one flooring to another, it's 180 degrees. The second important example you understand here is a X, AX3. AX3 is a trigonal planar. And with the trigonal planar, my example here would be my um, boron trifluoride. Um, in this situation, we have a boron is central and my fluorine is on the outside. So I have three central and three fluorines on the outside. The bond angle now, again, the bond angle, if you see here with the pin really quick, the bond angle is run between these fluorines right from here to here, from here to here, and from here to here. So you can kind of think of a, a 360 here in this situation. Um, the bond angle ends up being... <clears throat> The bond angle ends up being um, 120. So again, from each other, you have 120. The next one you have here is AX4. AX4 is uh, you have one central and you have four on the outside. This is a tetrahedron. And the example here we give you is methane, which is CH4. And so you have your uh, methane, your carbon loves to be central, your carbon will be central, and you have your four hydrogens around it. The bond angle now. Now, as you understand here, as you see, as you have more and more X's become into the picture, they actually start pushing each other closer and closer together. They have less room to work with. So, um, with this actual shape, we'll again, remember these electrons around the X's are pushing each other away as well. In that process, they reduce the bond angle now down to 109.5, 109.5. So, you must know these. These are first few examples. We have two more examples with ideal geometry. These are now our examples of our, go back to our expanded octet. And the first one we have is AX5. And this example was a, called a trigonal pyramid. Trigonal pyramid. And this was PCL5. PCL5. And this is again one of our examples of our expanded octet. Where we found that the phosphorus has five valence electrons. What happens is that lone pair comes in contact with chlorine. Chlorine have a very high electronegativity, causes that pair to separate out and form five bonds. So it has 10 electrons central. You have the bond angles within the um, actual uh, uh, within the actual triangle you see there with the broken line that's 90s uh, or 120s, excuse me. You have a, just like we saw, a trigonal planar. Um, in this situation, next one though, we have the Chlorines are opposite of each other, so they're, again, in relationship to the plane, they are running 90 degrees in relationship to the plane. So I have two bond angles must deal with here. My next one I'm dealing with is a AX6, and this one is by name octahedron. And octahedron, again, is one of our examples of our sulfur hexafluoride. This will expand our octet. Now the sulfur has six valence electrons, two are two lone pairs, which actually get separated out in individuals and form six bonds. Now my four are on the same plane. They form a square planar. But I have one fluorine going up and one fluorine going straight down. So the fluorines in relationship to the plane are all 90 degrees. Within the box, they're all 90 degrees as well. So it's 90 degrees straight around on my octahedron. You must know these. These are called ideal geometries. Next, moving on, we have what we call the Vesper Theory, and it's just the valence shell electron pair repulsion. And what we're going after here is revealing, we're now understand that when we have, when we have, uh, 
lone pairs around a central atom, we realize we have to understand these lone pairs have a greater repulsion force than do the actual elements themselves. And so what they will actually cause things to do is they cause, they even push the, uh, the X's further away from each other, or closer to each other, excuse me. So what we talk about here, Vesper, Vesper theory, let me fill this stuff in. First of all, this is the double or single bonds can be treated like single bonds, so we must understand that. A molecule has a resonance structure, and this Vesper theory can be applied to them. So even though we have um, Vesper theory comes into play, we can have resonance structures still. Um, and lone pairs of electrons, E, repel atoms, repel atoms more than bonding pairs, and that's what you must understand. They actually will repair, repel um, electrons more than actual elements to themselves, what they're going after. The first type we're going to talk about is going after an AX4. And we're going to talk about this. We're going to go out to our ideal geometry. This is not a Vesper. This is ideal geometry. And I want to start with the, the ideal geometry because I want to go back to our methane, which is our tetrahedron. And we see that our metrane was central, AX4. And the bond angles here were, you should know this, 109.5. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to start removing the hydrogens and leave a lone pair out there in place of the hydrogen. So the first one, we're going to represent the lone pair. We're going to represent them by the letter E. Your textbook does the same. represents lone pairs by the capital letter E. So I'm going to have AX3, E. So I still have four things around my A, but three of them are elements. One of them is a lone pair. The shape we're going to get here is a trigonal pyramid. Now, AX3, if you go back to your ideal geometry, was a trigonal planar, but no longer is that triangle on the same plane because that E pushes them out of the plane and forces them into a pyramid shape. An example here would be NH3. Now, you can see NH3, if you don't understand this about advanced electrons, you would say, oh, NH3, that is an AX3, it's trigonal planar. Wrong. And you say bond angle 120. Wrong. Why? Because off the nitrogen, there is a lone pair. Now, remember, nitrogen has five valence electrons, forms three single bonds for your hydrogen, has one lone pair remaining. Now, I want us to talk about those triangles again. The, the triangle, the broken line moving away, um, getting smaller as it moves towards the element, that means that they... That means that that, that hydrogen is showing a three-dimensional structure on a two-dimensional surface. So that hydrogen is going into my screen. The hydrogen, where they empty the empty triangle actually coming out, opening out, is showing that that hydrogen is coming out of the screen. So again, just showing a three-dimensional structure on a two-dimensional surface. But we see here in this example, we have a trigonal planar. Now, remember I told you that lone pair on top of the nitrogen pushes those remainder hydrogens even further away. So no longer is a trigonal planar in the bond angles 120, or we have four things around it, and our tri tri um, tetrahedron, we had 109.5. Now that fourth thing being a lone pair actually reduces it down to a 107.3. So we see a decrease in bond angle, because again, that remember that lone pair has a greater repulsion force than do the elements themselves. The next example we'll deal with, again, moving on here, we take another, another hydrogen away, and now we get an AX2E2. To replace it with another lone pair. The shape name for this one ends up being bent. The compound example of this is H2O. Now remember on the test, what I'm going to give you, I give you the compound. And from the compound, you need to determine the type, the geometry, the bond angle, and you be, need to be able to draw out the structure. And so this is going to be all be very, very important you actually do this. And so if, again, on the test, your goal is I give you the compound, you draw out the structure. From the structure, you determine the type, the geometry, and bond angle. So with this one, you know oxygen has six valence electrons, forms two two bonds with your hydrogen and has two lone pairs. So in this situation, what we'd say here, um, this is my, show me, write this in really quick here. This right here is your A. Here are your X's. So I get used to my board here. And here is your, here are your E's. One E up there and one E over there. And so a X two E two, and that's what we should. That's where we get the shape over here. A X two E two, and with that you know bent, and then also you know oh the bond angle on that one. Now that these actually been clo brought even closer, these are brought even closer together. Um, in this situation, what happens then is that with the bond angle reduces. Remember the last one we had was one oh, we had was one oh um, seven point. Three in this situation, we're going to go to. We actually now go to 104.5. So we're reducing the bond angle down even more.
Now the last one between, again, AX to E3, remember we started out with a tetrahedron, we kept on removing hydrogens and replaced them with, with lone pairs. This one's going to be linear, and linear is because, again, you're doing a relationship between your a, X and your A is all you have available there. Now, here this situation, we have hydrochloric acid, and my chlorine has seven valence electrons, six, lo three lone pairs, and one bond with hydrogen. Now, there's no other X to form a bond angle with. Remember, bond angles are formed between the X's, therefore, there is no bond angle with this one. So, this one is AX, AX E3 is linear, and there's no bond angle. Example here, what we just did here with our, and we saw this, we started out with our tetrahedron. In this situation, we started out with a tetrahedron, and we started out with a bond angle of 109.5. As we kept on replacing the lone pairs with, again, with, with the hydrogens with these lone pairs, what happens, our bond angle kept on getting lower and lower and lower, because what we did, we we, we push these hydrogens even closer and closer. The remaining X's get pushed even closer and closer together. Therefore, that's why the bond angle is actually decreasing. So again, very, very important you understand this and it'll be very valuable for you on the test, again, to be able to draw out these structures because based upon these structures is, again, where you're going to go and actually determine the actual ge geometric shape, the bond angle, the type, all that stuff comes into play. So the lone pair versus lone pair repulsion, we see the repulsion of lone pairs becomes greater and greater and greater. And we see the decrease in the bond angle. Now, one thing before we um, um, end with this, we are going to go over some additional shapes. These are actually in your book. Again, these are in your book, again, on table. Make a note of this, they're on table um, 10.2. Um, Make sure you know that and get in and take a look at this stuff. Remember I told you the book uses um, B, we use X, and so there's nothing different here. But just understand, I give you different examples here. Here's another bent sulfur dioxide. Another bent here has one lone pair around the, around the sulfur here in the central. Um, but again, even with that lone pair, it causes it not to be linear anymore. It's actually still bent. Um, then you have your trigonal, again, AX3. We did that one. AX3E, AX, AX2E2, we did that one. Um, AX4E, here's one called the seesaw. And so you should know that. We're gonna, we'll represent it by the seesaw. You should know this one. This is, again, very, very, all these are very, very valuable. Um, we have an AX3E2, and this one we have the, what we call the T-shape. Um, and if you actually look at it, you see a T-shape right there. There's your T-shape in that situation. And so an AX2E3. This one we have, the what, we, what happens here are these three lone pairs actually form a triangle remain in the same plane. And we have one of our elements going up, one of them going straight down. So it ends up being linear. Again, your X's, lone pairs between your X's. Um, another one, square pyramid. Um, understand this one. Uh, and then square planar. But now in this situation, now the lone pairs, <clears throat> the lone pairs end up being going straight up around from each other. So they go straight up here and they go down here and the actual elements remain on the same plane. So these actually, these lone pairs force the elements actually into the same plane and they keep them modified there forming a square planar. So again, know these, these are very valuable, they're gonna be helpful in the test.